Right, Mark. Okay, uh, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Wave at the back. Yep, great. Okay, uh, just introduce myself and company. Uh, my name is Mark Shannon. I've been playing around with Python for over a decade, and most of that I spent either working out how to optimize it or how to analyze it or how to break it, sort of as a side effect of those two things. Um, I authored PEP 412, and I was a BDF delegate for PEP 484. I think those are the right numbers. You'll have to Google them to check for me. Anyway, so before we kind of get into the, the depth of stuff, and while people are still arriving, we shall have a, uh, a mini space opera. So uh, this is the Curiosity Lander. Um, in February 2012, it was on flight to Mars, and NASA found a bug in the lander software. Now, the lander software is written in C, and in C, you can pass arrays around. But if you pass arrays around, the C language doesn't bother in, uh, passing the size around. So it's very easy to pass an array of one size to a function that's expecting an array of another size. So uh, NASA found one of these cases in testing, and uh, they asked us to uh, investigate, see if we could find any more cases of this. So we were able to write a nine-line query, um, and we were able to find another 30 instances of this. Uh, and we don't know exactly what NASA did, because all this uh, software is secret and closed source and sort of military grade, but we presume they fixed them. And we do know that Curiosity landed safely. So NASA is quite keen on static analysis, but NASA is somewhat risk averse. We wish to, uh, I want to try and convince you that code analysis is something that you can use, even if you are less risk averse than NASA. It's still worth your effort. I want to convince you that it'll, in the long run, it can save you time and money. The little bit of effort you need to put into using it will pay off. Now, uh, obviously, NASA's code was written in C, but we support a bunch of languages at LGTM. And one of those, and the one that I believe you're probably most interested in, is Python. So, what is code analysis? Code analysis is finding out facts about your program. Um, basically, anything or that you might want to think that you might think is interesting. So that could be metrics. Um, you could look for complexity in the code. Um, look for hotspots of complexity. All sorts of things. But one particular interesting sort of set of facts are bugs or likely bugs. Um, so I would like to uh, contrast code analysis with a couple of quality assurance things you probably already do. So uh, the first one is testing. I'm going to assume everyone tests their code. I'm not going to bother asking, because uh, I don't want to embarrass anyone. Uh, so testing is obviously very important for you know, checking that your code is safe to be released. But testing is very specific to a code base. And also, you need to write tests for everything you're interested in. Uh, if you write a new piece of code, you're going to have to write new tests for it. You can't rely on pre-existing tests or pre-existing sets of tests to find what you want. Whereas code analysis, often you can rely on pre-existing stuff. Uh, another quality assurance thing you'll probably use is code review. Now, code analysis is much more like code review. So a human code reviewer is going to look at the, the diff in your code and attempt to see what issues they can find with it. Hopefully, um, they'll do it in a positive and constructive fashion, but essentially are looking flaws for flaws in your code. So they might be looking for design flaws, but also will be just looking for smaller scale errors. Now, code analysis can take away a lot of that work. Um, code analysis can find those errors, and it's much, much more meticulous than any human could ever be. It can also work out where the, your changes interact with other pieces of code and double check the interaction, which is something that a code reviewer could very easily omit. So, that's makes, so what does make for good code analysis? Um, you know, it's not very useful. Okay, so let's go through this one by one. So, 
uh, it needs to be flexible. So given the NASA example, that was a, an error they had not anticipated. Had there been a sort of general purpose check they already had, that would have been fine, but because they didn't anticipate it, we need to create a new analysis on the fly, uh, reasonably quickly and reasonably easily. Uh, that's an important part of analysis. Another one is it's accurate. After all, imagine you have a watch, and whenever you look at it, it's right half the time. What do you do with the watch? Well, you just bin it. What about if it's right 90% of the time? Well, it's kind of useful, but not really that useful, but you probably keep it if you didn't have any other sort of means of taking the, checking the time. But what about watch that's 99.5, 99.8% accurate? Then, yeah, sure, you'd double check if there was a flight to catch, but otherwise you'd pretty much rely on it. And assuming you can rely on something, then it just makes your life easier because you're not kind of like double checking it or doubting it all the time. So accuracy is very important. And finally, you need to find, it needs to be useful. You need to be insightful. So PEP 8's all very well and good. We all love PEP 8, but does it really matter if there's 81 characters in a line? Or, you know, these minor little things? But what if analysis can find things like a... Uh, you know, cross-site scripting vulnerability or something like that, then that's really valuable. So obviously there's a huge range of things that we can find and it's kind of, you, you want the code analysis to find interesting things. So, can we do this for Python? And the answer is yes. The spoiler alert there. Um, but it, is a, it can be tricky compared with a static and, uh, statically typed language. So Python doesn't have any type annotations, uh, declarations. Of course, with type annotations, they are used, but there's relatively few of them. Also, because it has a history of uh, being dynamically typed, people tend to just pass values around and then locally check for things like, is something none? Uh, does something have a particular attribute? Is it callable or so on? Uh, before they do some operation on it. And we need to understand these sort of things. Also, people do things that are genuinely dynamic in Python, things that a code analysis tool is always going to struggle with, things like creating classes from a database schema on the fly. Um, that's pretty difficult to analyze. If you have the database schema to hand, then maybe you can integrate analysis of that, but generally you're not going to be able to do that. So in order to keep things accurate, we also need to know what we don't know. Um, Okay, so, um, right, I've said uh, flexibility is kind of important. So, um, our tool, LGTM, is, well, what makes it flexible? So, at heart, it contains an object-oriented query language. Um, the advantage of a query language is because it's declarative, we can just basically, you can just say, I'm looking for this sort of problem. Um, it's... And that allows you to find things in fairly brief, so uh, make fairly brief queries that will find what you want. So given the NASA example, I said there was a sort of nine line query. I'm not going to bother you with that because that uses the C libraries and so we're going to bother with Python. So I will give you a Python example though. So here's an example query. So basically what we're looking for here is a for loop and the thing it's iterating over is not an iterable. Um, and this query is pretty straight, pretty short. Uh, obviously, at first glance, it may not make a lot of sense. So I'll kind of explain how it works. So there are three clauses, much like any SQL query. We have a from clause, which sort of describes the, the, the program elements that we're interested in, a where clause, which relates them, and a select, which is just gets us our result. So in the from clause, we're looking for a for loop, an expression, a class, and an AST node, an AST node, we'll just, at this point, we'll just say is that's just some point in the program. And we're interested in that so that we have some marker that we can look at when we see a result so we know where we're, what we're looking at and how to fix it. So the key thing is, if we just look for, we're not looking for any old combination of those. We're looking for them, a specific relation between them. So the first thing is that the expression is the thing in the for loop. So that's our first line in the where clause, We're basically saying that the, uh, the iterable in the for loop is iter. And then the next one is probably the key point, and that's basically saying that that expression 
the values it refers, what it refers to, or the set of values it could hold. Um, we don't care about the value, but we are interested in the class of those value and, and the origin as we know where it came from for producing results. And the last, two, the last line says, obviously, that it's not iterable, but you'll note that we're not saying that it isn't iterable. We're saying that I, we don't know that it is iterable, which is why we have the second clause, which says we, don't, we do know something about it. I have a hand up. Oh, sorry, uh, unders underscore is a convention meaning ignore this value. Um, I believe that's SQL convention as well, but I don't really use SQL, so um, anyone can correct me later if I'm wrong. Uh, so, yeah, so that really is, we, don't, we don't care about that value. And then we select the loop and the origin, which is usually a uh, useful helper to, find, to tell us where the value came from so we can fix the errors. So, flexibility is that you can write these brief queries and you can write your own queries. So what makes it accurate um, or precise? This is uh, that refers to that we had in the previous slide. That is in, that's basically wrapping all our analysis in the library. So I'm now gonna go through the library. Um, right, let me check my time. Yep, that's good. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go through some examples, and I'm going to show some example code. Um, it's kind of nice to show real code, but there's a couple of reasons not to. Real code is far too big, won't fit on a slide. Uh, usually what tends to happen is that the cause of an error and the manifestation of an error are not necessarily in the same place. Uh, it makes it awkward to grind. And there's another equally important reason, which is I don't really want to like choose some arbitrary piece of code and sort of point at it and say, ah, look, there are bugs in your code. So I, th I think we, so it's much better where the, the finger points at myself and the code is clearly intentionally buggy, as you can probably guess from the name buggy code there. So uh, hopefully I won't upset anyone. So the first, uh, First piece of analysis we can do is basically to parse the source code and produce an abstract syntax tree. An abstract syntax tree is basically a tree that uh, describes the structure of the source code. So in the very simple code on the left, it produces the abstract syntax tree on the right. Now, uh, this is, assume this is a piece of a whole module, not just a snippet of code. The tree on the right the top level is the module itself, and that contains two statements, an assignment and a for loop. The assignment is broken down into the target of the assignment, which is the left-hand side, which is numbers. Now, note that numbers is just a name rather than a string, so it's a name and then numbers, and then the value is just the value one. Now, this is abstract syntax tree rather than what's other called a concrete parse tree. Now, a concrete parse tree would contain things like um, the parentheses around the one, which we've omitted from the abstract syntax tree because it doesn't affect the meaning. It's just extra syntax. Likewise, there's no actual marker for the, the, the for or the in um, tokens. They're just omitted. The for loop's a little bit more complicated. The target, again, is the thing that gets assigned, which is n. The iter, which is, if you recall from our query with the loop.getiter, that's the uh, iterator. And then there's a body, which is just a list of statements. In this case, one statement. That statement is an expression statement whose value is a call. And the call calls a name, which is print, and has the args name n. And those dot, dot, dots are just for there's maybe a few other bits to do with regarding the, the presence or lack of star args and star star args and annotations and such forth. Uh, except there's no annotations in the call. Forget the annotations bit. Um, okay, so if we have a look at that piece of code and we run it through our tools, it tells us that indeed we, can, we have an error there. So uh, n... So if uh, this is a screenshot because I didn't trust the Wi-Fi, but I think I should have a, uh, where is it? Uh, alerts, 
non iterator for loop, one simple. Why is this not working? Oh, here we are. Right, okay, so this is actually on the web. Um, yeah, so if I click on that, it'll highlight the, uh, the origin, which is where the origin bit comes in. So basically we, even, we can say that numbers is an integer and you shouldn't iterate over an integer. Okay, so that's the AST. That's our kind of first, first thing we do in our analysis. Uh, the, uh, oh, I need to go back to presentation. So our next step is a control flow graph. Uh, if you look at the program on the left, you'll see that this one is uh, somewhat redundant, but uh, is correct. And that the numbers we are iterating over this time is the tuple one, two, three. Now the AST would have just said we have numbers, uh, two assignments called numbers, and it doesn't give us any information about ordering. It sort of gives us ordering, information about ordering, but not accurate enough to be, to be generally useful. Whereas a control flow graph does. So a control flow graph basically is a graph that emulates the way that the uh, interpreter actually executes the code. So if you, first of all, if you look for the, you see the octagonal elements, the module, there's an entry and an exit point for this whole flow graph. The orange one at the top is the entry and the gray one mostly at the bottom, near the bottom is the uh, exit point. And then it simply flows through the code. So the, essentially what it evaluates is we evaluate the constant one, then we assign it to numbers, then we evaluate the constants one, two, three, create a tuple. Uh, and then evaluate, assign that to numbers, and then we go through the for loop. And the for loop basically it says load numbers and then loop over its uh, items, printing each other one at a time. Um, I don't know how, that's reasonably clear. Uh, yeah, the, the Google Docs won't allow you to put F SVGs up, so I, I'm not sure the resolution of the PNG is great. Um, okay, so that's great. So we no longer, we're not coming up with a false positive because of uh, uh, we're choosing one when we should know it's t t a tuple. But things can get more complicated. So uh, in this case, if this was just the code, obviously we would stop as soon as we hit random with a name error. But let us assume that random is defined somewhere else as something that is either genuinely random or something the analysis can't work out whether it's true or false. It doesn't really make a lot of difference. Now, in the, at the beginning of the second if statement, we, from our, we know that numbers is either one or it's one, two, or three. So it's either an int or a tuple. Now, um, if it's an int or a tuple, we track it through and we're going to see some errors. So we're going to think that, well, in either for loop, numbers could be an int or a tuple. So there's a, those are both errors in both uh, loops. But of course, there's only an error in the second loop because uh, the first loop checks to, is uh, guarded by the check to see if it's a tuple. So the one cannot reach that. But the control flow graph doesn't really show us that because uh, the control merges. So what we need to do is what's called data flow. So data flow, essentially, we track the, uh, the values or the set of values or some, some, some approximation to the exact values, obviously, because we can't execute the code that give us the information we need. In this case, we can just, because these are simple constants, we just track those. And what will happen, of course, is that our flow here, oh, I should mention that if you can see, apologies for those people who are colorblind, but the uh, green and the blue arrows, the green corresponds to the case where the condition is true, and the blue con corresponds to the condition where it's false. And we can track through the value. So basically, as we go through the second branch, um, the, that test will eliminate one of the values on either side, such that the uh, first for loop, we know that the, the value one will not get there. So we track the value of one from the assignment. And then as we go through the test, and the test is true, 
Obviously, one is not a tuple, so at that point, that value is discarded. And then, obviously, there's no error in the first for loop. But in the second for loop, obviously, that's just merely testing that it isn't a tuple. One isn't a tuple. So then we hit that, and then there's an error there. So we can see that on our website. Um, and you can see there's an error in the, in the second loop, but not in the first, as we've uh, able to work out that the, from the data flow that uh, we're not seeing, uh, two, we're seeing an integer for the second one, but not for the first one. But, of course, there's a reason, there's cases where that doesn't work. So, this is a slightly contrived case, but you do see things like this where people do a test, uh, set some conditional value, and then do a, the same test later on, and then use the thing they set in the first test, uh, for example. And it, this can happen in try, uh, imports as well. You might see code that's like try import foo, and then accept import error foo equals none. And later on, there's a test that says if foo, because modules are always true, uh, do something using foo, and we need we need to track that. So uh, here's the program and the control flow graph on the the right, and we have no our data flow is insufficient to prevent us getting a false positive here, because uh, flags and numbers are different. So all we know about numbers at the point we hit if flag is that it's uh, one or the tuple. Flag is nothing to do with that, so both pass through that test, and then we get, an, we get a false positive. So what we can do is to split the control flow graph. Um, so basically, what we do is this transformation. Um, so if you see, we basically what we do is we, we don't rejoin the flow after the if statement. And then we can basically duplicate and move the test, the if flag test, into each branch. And then it should be obvious that it fairly trivially falls out which loop gets run and which doesn't. You know, if false and if true are pretty straightforward. And then it's fairly clear that in the first, on the right hand side, uh, that loop is never going to be executed. On the right-hand side, it's safe to be executed because numbers is one, two, three. Now, obviously, we don't do this transformation on the source code because that messes up everything else. So we, we do it on the control flow graph. And here's the transformation. Um, I, and now, what the other thing to note here is that you might think this, is, this has a tendency to just blow things up horribly. It's actually not so bad. We do limit the amount of splitting we do in order to avoid it blowing up. But often, we are the, once you split, you can often, because you split on cases where there are repeated tests, you can often then prune some of those branches. So you will note that on the right-hand side, the, on the left-hand branch, which follows the true test of the first place, the, we also know that the second test is therefore o can only be false, and, because it's, uh, and on the other, other side, it's the other way around. So consequently, um, we're able to prune those extra branches, and you'll see there's really no, the, the right-hand side is really no larger than the, the left-hand side. Sometimes it, do, it, it does expand, and uh, particular cases where you have like a, an early test, and then a whole lot of code, and then another test that matches, and then there, there tends to be some duplication. But generally, we don't see much of an increase in size of the control flow graphs with this. So, uh, well. So far, so good. But you will have noticed that all of that stuff was very localized. And data tends to flow around a program through calls and so on. So have a look at this code. So is this correct? Um, well, yes, it is. Because we can I we're either calling print numbers with false and an integer, in which case, if it's flag is false, we don't loop, or with true and a tuple, and if it is true, then that's OK to loop. So what we need to do here is if we track the calls from print numbers, uh, the, the code at the bottom, into the function, that's not quite sufficient. Because what values can flag have in the call, uh, in the function, where well, it could be true or false. Numbers could be one or the tuple. 
and then we're unable to distinguish. So what we need is something called call context, which is where we basically pass the context from which we call something, and that enables us to disambiguate this. Um, so basically, in order to be correct, either we need to not go, you, go track any values through calls or for a very restricted set, or we can use call context. Again, call context is something where potentially you can blow up the sort of size of things we're analyzing. But uh, yeah, we need to sort of carefully limit that to try and find interesting stuff without uh, being, killing performance too much. And there's more, but we don't really have time because yeah, I could go, I could carry on like this for all day, all day. So I think hopefully I've convinced you that our analysis is uh, reasonably accurate as a result of uh, using all these techniques. Um, let me just check my notes. Cool. Okay. So, uh, I, now a quick bit over, run over lgtm.com. Uh, here's the front page for Django. Um, we s analyze a large number of open source projects. Um, not quite as many as we would like. So if yours isn't up there, um, and you think it ought to be, come and talk to me. But generally, I think if the, I think we aim to analyze most of the, most stuff on GitHub and Bitbucket. Um, I'll just quickly run through this so you can see the number of contributors, the number of alerts, which are things that, some of those errors, other, other things are just sort of recommendations and, and warnings, which are probably less important, uh, lines of code and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, I'm picking Django because it's reasonably good code, so I, hopefully I'm embarrassing anyone and something pretty much everyone's heard of. Uh, now, uh, another project, one slightly less famous and of uh, lower quality. Um, but I want to highlight that uh, we do pull request integration, so if you think this is, uh, might be valuable for your project, you want to look through the alerts, and if you think this is, yeah, you want to know about this every time you have a pull request, we do pull request integration. All you need to do is uh, log in to LGTM, you need to get a user ID, and then go to your project, and you can click pull requests. Right. Now, that's a bit of formality. Now, here's the sort of interesting stuff. So, as I said, flexibility is key. Flexibility means you have a problem that I haven't anticipated. Um, and you would like to find other instances of that problem. Well, you can write your own query. Now, this is a query language, it's a custom query language. Uh, it's declarative programming. It's somewhat different to the sort of programming you might be used to. So I appreciate that although these queries look very concise, it's sometimes not entirely straightforward to get your head around it. Um, but I would recommend you have a go. And so, just to recap, good code analysis should be flexible, accurate, and give you valuable results. Insightful, in some ways, is up to you. If you need to know something about your code, and you can write a query to do it, then that's pretty insightful. Okay, I think. That is it. So, um, there's an open space on code analysis. I, I want to invite other people who are interested, the uh, Koala people and so on as well, um, to that. But if you want to come along and chat to me, I'll be around after the talk. I'll be at the sprints. And if you thought that was all kind of cool, we're hiring. Uh, does anyone end a talk without saying that? But we are, oh, Larry's put his hand up. <laughs> okay, but, but uh, yeah, we are hiring. Uh, if you think this is cool and you'd like to work on this, we're um, hiring for doing Python analysis uh, from the web front end, for the core infrastructure, and if you want to do C++ or Java analysis or the like, we're also hiring for those. Um, okay, I think that's it. Is there any questions?
So I we have um, something like 15 minutes for questions. And I already see some questions going over there. Um, I can go with the mic from the side of the room. Um, I just tried it in parallel and tried to add my project. And it says I can't build it because some headers are missing. So how is that stuff handled if you have non-Python dependencies? Also did not find our requirements text because it's not in the top directory. We have a requirements.d and in there are the requirement files because we don't have just one, we have multiple. So. Okay, uh, uh, I think that's probably better for you to discuss that offline. But yeah, the, 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 we are, the problem is we do essentially just scan everything and, and if it's pretty standard, we build it and if it's not, we'll, we'll need a bit of custom configuration. Um, but I'll, 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 I'll look into that because we're always wanting to, to fix these issues. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, static analysis is great and, and like, especially if you're doing C, C++, Java, any of those static languages, if you're programming in those and you aren't using static analysis, start using it yesterday because it will find massive amounts of bugs that otherwise you wouldn't. But in Python, the problem is that I've used several of these tools and whatever always seems to be happening is that uh, you, you enable them and for, because Python is, is so dynamic, you get massive amounts of false positives and they just overwhelm you and all of the, the valuable things get lost. So do you have any sort of like numbers or estimates on, on how your false positive rate is? Um, well, this is the accurate thing. So this is what I was saying earlier about knowing what you don't know. Um, so to put it technically, I would say we attempt to um, ensure that our knowledge, our, our set of facts that we're trying to present to you and which you can base your queries is as large a strict subset of the truth as we can manage. Um, and with the, that in mind, there should in theory be no false positives at all. Um, obviously, we're not perfect. Uh, so we do have some false positives, but we generally regard any false positive as a bug. Um, with a handful of exceptions where to do the analysis completely perfectly accurately would give us essentially no results and we're prepared to trade a few false positives to get meaningful results on most projects. Um, but as to numbers, it's kind of hard to say because we don't know how many errors there are in a program. So we can't come up with a number as to what our false positive rate is. Uh, but as I say, I mean, we, we aim for zero. Uh, it's not an achievable goal, but um, it's definitely something we, we take pretty seriously. Uh, as far as I saw, you have it as a service online. Uh, do you offer it as a self-hosted service, for example, for companies that have like proprietary reasons for not putting their code online? Okay, um, I basically answer is I don't do sales. Uh, I, my boss has told me off of trying to do sales because I'm an engineer and I'm not very good at it. So uh, yeah, don't, don't ask me. Um, but this is all free for open source. Um, if you, if you want to use it commercially, then you should contact us directly through sales. So semol.com. Oops. So when uh, the, those, there are those new type annotations in Python 3 now, uh, do you also make use of that when you run the analysis? Okay, so um, I didn't cover type annotations and we don't use much, uh, take much information from them. Uh, basically we sort of like, it's generally, you know, the development is an ongoing process and we'll focus on what gives us the best sort of like improvement at the time. So uh, in including type hints is definitely something is on the cards and we particularly want to do it for uh, analyzing stub files for the built the standard library and so on because our, our standard library analysis is kind of just, we did a one-off analysis of the C code and then tried to write some queries on that to generate type information, but that's relatively weak compared with what's now in the, the typing stubs. So we want to use those. Of course, the worry is that um, any error in stub files is just going to manifest itself as a false positive. 
So that's something that's definitely a concern. But um, yeah, so the, the plan is is to, to to take advantage of those, but not to try and do type checking as such as merely using those as sources of information for the more so sort of general data flow. Thank you. Any other question? Oh, one here. I'll go. Um, do you have um, examples of um, bugs that were fixed uh, in open source projects uh, thanks to LGTM or even uh, projects that uh, embraced uh, the tool? Um, not off the top of my head. Uh, I can dig you out a list if you if you want some evidence later on. Uh, but I mean, going back a long time, we found bug in the the two seven standard library, which is a kind of funny little one. So in two seven, if you implement dunder equals but not dunder not equals, then uh, the interpreter gives you different results for equality and inequality. So I think it was weak ref set um, in 2.7 a while ago. I mean, it's a long time ago. It's supposed to be like four or five years ago, I think, if it was fixed. Um, it was both equal and not equal to itself. And we, we used that as a little demo. And unfortunately, I think someone from the core developer team was in that demo, and they fixed it with an hour, so we had to find a different demo. Um, and we found in, in various other projects. So various things. Um, so interestingly, we had something that looked like a false positive in Flask, but it turned out that there was actually something wrong in the requirements.test uh, for Flask. It was saying it needed click 2.0 or higher, and it was giving us an error that said we, there was a, you were calling it with a, an argument that didn't exist in, um, in the function being called. But when you corrected the requirements to click four, then the, the error went away. So, so kind of sometimes you find like rather indirect errors like that. So I can claim standard library and Flask. So you know. Any other questions? Good. Hi, Mark. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Oh. Just wondering, on one of the slides there, you appear to, uh, to generate code that was also Python, but an improved version. So I'm just wondering, is it possible to save? You know, if you put in a project, um, can you spit out improved code as such that we can then do? When you said improved code, did you mean the transformation on the flow graph? Yeah. Well, no, well no. I wouldn't say that's an improvement. It's got duplicate code in it, so I would say it's definitely not an improvement. So, um, so analysis tools, much like compilers, are going to transform the code and do all sorts of weird things with it during their analysis. Um, and some of the intermediate representations of code are going to be truly atrocious, incomprehensible code. But they are—they make things more explicit as far as the analysis is concerned internally. But you should leave the code as it is. Uh, I mean, if there's errors in your code, fix them, obviously. And if things are unclear, make them clearer. But that's not, you shouldn't really do that for the benefit of the tools. Any other question? Well, I do have a question. Okay. So I will ask away. <laughs> um, so can you give us an idea on uh, about how many um, projects your, uh, your company is processing in general? Uh, and also I'm kind of curious what kind of infrastructure, if you can share anything about that, you folks have to run your system on all these um, projects? Um, there's some numbers. How heavy. So... 50,094 projects, apparently. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, I hope that number's right. Um, yeah, it's kind of... So uh, this, this is including Java, JavaScript, and Python. Uh, I think probably half of, roughly half of those will be, or maybe even more, JavaScript. Um, probably sort of... I don't know. Anyway, I'm not sure of the ratios, but it's it's JavaScript is the the largest number, then Python, then Java. But I think that's just because uh, our proportion of projects we analyze at the moment is lower for Java because of the build issues and so on. Um, but yeah, this this number should go up, and and if we add languages, it'll definitely go up further. 
Any other question? Going once, going twice, going, go on. Well, let's thank the speaker again. Great talk. Great talk.